coordinator of Cure Guidance Greece, and on behalf of the whole network, I would like to welcome you to the webinar on democratic participation in guidance. I believe that most of you are aware of your guidance network and its activities, aimed among others to guidance counselor competencies development, and many of you have already participated in a similar events in the past. In this framework, the network decided to hold a webinar on the subject of democratic participation that affects every aspect of the career guidance field. Before the very interesting presentations that are going to follow, I would like to inform you that the webinar is being recorded and, it, and it's going to be that way until the discussion part. The discussion part will not be recorded. And uh, of course, uh, to, I would want to let you know that the speakers will distribute their PPT presentations. So, uh, with the valuable contribution of two experts, we will have the opportunity to familiarize ourselves both with the democratic approach to career guidance and, with, and additionally, with examples of good practices on democratic approach in working with individuals from different backgrounds. But to start with, in order to set the theoretical framework of the webinar, I will give the floor to Mr. Dimitris Gaitanis, Head of the Career Directorate of EOPEP, Euroguidance Center of Greece, to give us an overview of the core principles in democratic participations. Mr. Gaitanis, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Bully. Uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm Dimitris Gaitanis from Euroguidance Greece, and uh, my uh, presentation is a brief one. It mainly aims to set the framework um, in order to for the two distinguished guests to delve into the issues uh, later. Um, and uh, I will mainly try to make some questions to ourselves uh, in order uh, to um, give the answers later, I think. So I will share my presentation now. I hope you see it. Yes, Dimitri, it's okay. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, what are the core principles? of the democratic participation in career guidance. First of all, what constitutes democratic career guidance? I think that democratic career guidance is the equal and inclusive participation of all stakeholders in access, provision, and planning and evaluation of career guidance so that no one is left behind. And I think this is can be uh, analyzed in three uh, aspects. First of all, democratic access. We should guarantee the right, the famous right for career guidance. So here the question is, do all people receive stable, lifelong, life-wide career guidance? Sometimes uh, see this in statewide guidance. Then are all people aware of career guidance, its aims, methods, and available services? Or sometimes guidance is misunderstood. Which target groups are excluded? Is the cost of the services for the vulnerable a barrier? Do we provide physical access for the handicapped, including location, distance, and infrastructure? And language access for people of different cultural backgrounds, for example, refugees. Then passing on to the democratic provision. Is career guidance seamless and coherent, coherent, sorry, so that people do not fall in gaps? Which target groups receive career guidance of a different level of quality? So access is one thing, but quality is another thing. Do different channels of provision influence equity? For example, we have seen that in the pandemic, we discovered uh, and we somehow uh, limited ourselves in a, cert in a certain way of uh, a certain channel of providing guidance. Is, is, is this ethical? 
Are the principles of career guidance kept during provision? For example, impartiality, and which are these principles? What are the practitioner and service competence requirements in order to provide democratic provision of career guidance? Which technological, for example, artificial intelligence, financial and social developments can challenge the democratic provision? For example, a new study of CEDEFOP has shown has proved once more that in small and medium sized enterprises is less career guidance is, pro is provided a far more less way than in bigger enterprises. And then we all know, of course, that uh, the privileged societies and the privileged individuals receive better career opportunities, job opportunities and education opportunities. Finally, democratic planning and evaluation. Do all career guidance sectors, education, training, employment, unemployment, social sectors and stakeholders cooperate, coordinate equally in planning and evaluation of career guidance? Is the strategy and policy of career guidance a top down or a bottom up approach? Is the voice of the users heard in design, management and evaluation of career guidance services and products? And finally, are the policies, strategies and services citizen centered the famous principle that again more than 20 years have been said that career guidance put the citizen at the center and i would like to close with this picture from athens because we come from athens and you know that the direct democracy in the years of pericles and here is the picture of pnika the place opposite of the acropolis of athens where uh, the gathering of all free people happened every time that the state wanted to need to needed to take some political decisions uh, in every aspect of the social life and so um it was the uh, ecclesia of Demo, as we said the, the church of the municipality and uh, here the most famous phrase is who desires to speak is our Evan Vulete. thank you very much and we are eager to hear um to distinguish speakers to analyze all of these subjects uh, and give us the examples of good practice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitris, for giving us the big picture and the base to proceed and deepen to the subject of the webinar and uh, to, to make the, the connection with uh, Greece, since we have the honor to coordinate this webinar. Because yes, I think uh, democracy and the democracy and the theater are the biggest uh, gifts from uh, from Greece to the whole world. To the whole world. Thank you, Dimitris, once more. And now we have uh, we are very happy and very honored to call Mrs. Didri Hughes, Associate Professor, Warren University Institute for uh, Employment and Sets. We had the opportunity to post her in uh, our uh, conference this May. And uh, it's very important that uh, with her, her presentation, uh, uh, Deidre will explore how principles of democracy can be applied to every aspect of career guidance, and additionally, to examine the critical role of stakeholders in education, employment, and other community settings. Deidre, you have the floor. We are very eager to listen to you. Welcome. The microphone, in, please. When okay. will I ever learn to make sure my microphone is switched on? Good morning, okay. everyone. Uh, my name is Deirdre Hughes. I'm based here in the UK. And um, I would like to begin really by uh, thanking Vule and all of the conference organisers to Euroguidance and indeed to, to Mitris, our previous speaker, who I think has really set the scene very, very clearly around those big issues to do with um, a democratic approach uh, to uh, career guidance. I've got about uh, 30 minutes or so, and I'd like to make sure that um, you feel that you can ask any question as you go along. I think there'll be a question and answer session with the speakers at the end, and I'll be available. But please do use the chat 
I'm going to share some slides and I'm going to require you to um, put something in the chat early on. I may not be able to see it, so uh, Vuli or Demetrius, I'll ask you to, to guide me as to what's in the chat when I pose a question to the audience. So I have spent most of my professional life working in the field of career uh, development. I previously worked in um, social services um, where I thought at one stage I might want to be a social worker and prior to that I worked in the civil service but I've also worked in a number of private um, organizations as well. And what I wanted to do really today is to just whet your appetite around getting you to think about in your own country, in your own context, how can you empower individuals to actually be able to lead a fulfilling lives and to make really good uh, career development uh, decisions? And what I thought I would do to begin with really was to just show you that part of my work, I'm very, very interested in the use of artificial intelligence and indeed how that will um, uh, either benefit or perhaps disadvantage individuals going forward. So what I'm going to do is have a conversation with you in four parts. I'm going to say a little bit about my background and influences. I come from a place called Coleraine in Northern Ireland. And you'll see here a beautiful image um, of Downhill, a place where um, I grew up uh, in, not too far away. And the reason I wanted to sort of share that with you is that I've been greatly influenced throughout my career in sort of thinking about how do we ensure that everyone has equal access to career support services. And I grew up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles where I could see the devastating effects of war, the devastating effects of people not being able to have a line of sight to work. So I want to begin really by just um, encouraging you to sort of think about this notion of a democratic approach to career guidance has got to be culturally relevant and sensitive to local situations linking those sorts of environments. We'll have a look at some waves of change and uncertainty. I'm going to plant a few seeds and ideas around this democratic approach to career guidance and then invite you to think about leadership development, impact, and ideas for action. So in the chat facility, I would like you, please, to answer this question just with a yes or with a no. When you were aged 16, did you benefit from career guidance from a public sector organization? Can you remember when you were 16, did you benefit from career guidance? A just a yes or a no. And maybe Bully or Demetrius will give me an idea because I can't see the chat when I'm uh, sharing my screen. How many people just broadly are the majority saying yes or no? Ah, uh, half, half. Two no's, one yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, no, no. No, 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 no. No, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, the reason I'm posing that question is, of course, we are arguing within a democracy for greater investment in career guidance for individuals. And I think one of the things that um, I want to sort of remind all of us is that we are passionate about this subject, whereas uh, there are many others who are less passionate than us. And so Euro guidance is about bringing everyone together to identify, discuss and disseminate initiatives that involve um, individuals in service configuration and career support innovation. And I'm going to try and make the case to you as to why this is really important. Now, every one of you will be familiar with the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which frame all um, of um, important issues in every uh, country, um, these um, sort of, if you like, 17 key areas cut across all aspects that every country uh, faces. And in many ways, in a career guidance context, um, we can see that these um, can help frame our work as well around democratic approach to career guidance. 
But one of the things I think that we must bear in mind is that the COVID pandemic precipitated radical changes in how societies design and deliver services. Migration, war, conflict, and a cost of living crisis in many countries has required, if you like, more effort and energies of advocates for careers and well-being support to work in overdrive alongside organizations and civil society groups to really begin to gather evidence to urge policymakers and um, leaders to invest in career support. And many of you, I hope, will be familiar with the Investing in Career Guidance um, uh, booklets uh, that have been co-produced by OECD, ILO, ETF, UNESCO, CEDAFOP, etc. But there are three ways, I think, that we can look at democratic career guidance. The first is we can say that livelihoods matter, supporting individuals to reach their full potential, increase their well-being, their income, and ideally provide study and work satisfaction, is a very, very straightforward argument that few people could resist that livelihoods matter, regardless of the context of where you live and where you actually work. The devastating health, social and economic effects in rich and poor countries alike strengthens the call for more places and spaces for personalised support. So as society and the world of work changes, we've got to develop confidence, skills and competence and these will be essential around helping people to thrive and, and survive. And thirdly, humans in the loop. So whilst part of a democratic approach to career guidance I'm going to show you today is that we seize technology and real-time data-driven solutions, that humans in the loop are essential. This don't give up, you're not alone and you matter is in essence what wraps around really, really good career guidance support. So technological solutions like AI, virtual reality, gaming, chatbots, avatars may suit some people actually, but will um, many people will want some form of human uh, support. Just bear with me, yeah. So new pathways and support are needed as the traditional routes to good livelihoods are no longer enough. And if we just look alone at uh, mental health and well-being and what's happening in societies um, across the world, that if ever there was a time where we need really good communication about a, a democratic approach to career guidance, um, now is the time. And I think it's important to say that there's no universal solution. We've got to spread the learning for effective initiatives from different countries and different settings. And this is what Euro Guidance in particular does so well. Over the last year, I've been involved in three uh, publications, which will be uh, released next year, three new books. And at the heart of those three new books, is the co-design and development of community spaces and online uh, community places and online spaces, including generative artificial intelligence with humans in the loop. But I think there are three books that I um, have uh, had the privilege of working with colleagues on. I want to just take one or two thing, one thing out of each of the three areas to again get you thinking about this. Um, how are we distributing the scarce resources that we have from a public policy context? How are we distributing them fairly, equitably and in an inclusive way? So one of the things that we can do is we can think about, are we as a profession really being sufficiently creative in methods of guidance and counselling? So can we actually think about new ways of doing things that um, not new for the sake of it, but that our services are highly personalized to um, the individual. 
And again, I can give you a link. There's a special issue on this topic of creative methods. And that can be anything from using career writing um, to help support individuals to actually using um, a different uh, two chair technique where we're using skillful practice to help individuals to actually think about how their lives are unfolding and how those three elements um, I mentioned earlier uh, can help them move uh, forward. Decent work, inclusion and sustainability. I think there's a very interesting um, overview of um, how, if you like, how to defeat the dictators. It's a book by Charles Dunst. And it's an aspirational book about how democracies can do a better job of competing with autocracies um, and it's bursting with um, stats. And so to convince us that, um, you know, there is an argument here that maybe in our democracies, we haven't quite got things right. Um, Charles Dunst gives us a few very powerful statistics. First of all, uh, he sets out that China has increased spending on education as a percentage of its uh, gross domestic product by 75% since 1975. And if we look in 2018, Chinese students, 15 year olds, have the highest average scores in uh, world, if you like, tests on math, science and reading alongside Singapore, uh, at Hong Kong. Um, and in essence, there are three things that I think we can take away from this notion of decent work, inclusion and sustainability that I would invite you to think about. One is about um, weak safety nets. They damage citizen confidence in their governments and therefore they should be strengthened, argues Dunst. I'm coming to come back on this notion of career guidance as a safety net. But if safety nets are weak, then basically citizen confidence in their government weakens. Bad healthcare systems cost more in the long run than good ones. And investments in infrastructure repay themselves over, um, you know, many times um, over. And this is this is what Dung sets out that. Democracies, for example, like the US, Germany, the UK, um, sort of whilst positive net migration rates are at least sort of 2.7%. If we look at other countries, what we see is that um, democracies, of course, um, uh, compared to um, the opposite of a democracy, dictatorship or um, uh, autocratic uh, government, What's compelling about democracies is that they remain attractive because of they offer more freedom, equality and opportunities uh, to pursue happy, happiness. But I think uh, if I just quickly move to migration, one of the big arguments and challenges that lie ahead across Europe and further afield is for governments to convince their populations of the benefits of um, immigration uh, policies and strengthening those. But Demetrius mentioned earlier about the haves and the have nots. And Dunst reminds us really that our education systems need to become more democratic. For example, at Harvard, the acceptance rate for alumni children is 30% versus 60% for the general population. And in 2021, about a third of legacy freshmen um, from households that were making more than half a million uh, dollars. So the point here is that when non-connected parents see underperforming children from more privileged backgrounds getting ahead because of connections, then they were obviously that leads to a sense of rebellion in, in the system. And so I guess, what does that mean then all of that? What does that mean in practical terms for a democratic approach to career guidance? Well, what it means is really that career guidance is if you like the oil in the system, that young people's access to local career guidance and 
you know, supporting transitions, decisions, mental health and well-being has to be a golden thread woven into government, department and citizen consultations and delivery plans. Viewed not just as a, a solution that enables the continuance of services, but also for personalization and more uh, tailored uh, support. And I want to invite you to sort of think about these principles very, very quickly. First of all, that dialectic between the individual and the social structures, between the things they are and the things they could be. And Ronald Sultana in Malta calls this an emancipatory impulse that career education and guidance is designed to create an emancipatory impulse to help individuals think about who they are, where they are, and how the world is and what it could be. In really important principle of collaborative and inclusive um, decision making, incorporating those democratic values and addressing inequities that Demetra set out. And then just this intersection of politics um, and justice. And just to say that for politics and justice, we have this struggle of adversaries who, whilst they have the same, if you like, shared adhesion to a, a sort of political uh, principle of democracy. There are, of course, disagreements um, about a range of issues and about how society should be organised or how particular problems should be solved. And so in a career guidance context, what we've got to do is step in and be clear and confident about our voice. And I would suggest that our voice needs to, first of all, recognise that there are changing attitudes of the workforce and changing attitudes of young people coming through our education system. So how confident are we at articulating, if you like, the differing attitudes that are beginning to emerge in a modern uh, society? And also, how are we as a careers profession contributing to education for life readiness, no longer just about didactic teaching, but rather about learning through collaborative, experiential and community-based projects that address the issues that students really care about. Something like a grand challenge that young people really care about can actually transform not just their education, but their career decision-making as well. How are we developing skills for the future? Are we relaxing the curriculum to allow scope for career guidance professionals to help individuals explore their interests and their, their passions? And I would argue that the tide is turning, that we are seeing now a move more towards hybrid career guidance and looking particularly at midlife career reviews for people in the workforce. So career guidance in this context is about good work and us understanding the good work dimensions. So where do we fit in terms of good work dimensions? Where can we actually help? Maybe, you know, as well as social support and cohesion and work-life balance, maybe what we do not do enough of as a profession is voice and representation of how we are actually beginning to share the findings, the evidence around what's happening in a contemporary world of transitions. So I want to make the case to use evidence to strengthen and co-create these pathways so that we are contributing through our skillful practice to more equitable opportunities. Now, I only have half an hour and I'm keeping an eye on the time. So I just want to um, speak to those of you here in the audience who maybe are thinking about, well, I work in education, so how can I gather evidence? Well, here is just an overview and you can look at this outside of uh, today's presentation about return on investment. Hey, for did the, sorry, can you make a... a bigger uh, slide, your presentation, full screen, because I think it's small, isn't it, for all of you? Maybe say it's on a big screen, I have because it's a, it's, a, it's a small. 
Ah, is it? I'm so sorry because on my screen it's it's on full screen. Yes, so but here um, it's not. Maybe it's uh, easier if you. Sorry for the interruption, but. No, it's okay. I, I see it full screen. I full see. I see it full screen. So. Do you? Okay, so maybe yeah. in me it's problem. So sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the current slide. Can everyone see this full screen? Maybe in the chat, just pop that in the chat. Can you see it? Yes. Ah, Can you? Lovely. Yeah, I'm good, but I can't see the chat. <laughs> OK. So I was just saying that if you um, are thinking about a democratic approach to career guidance, evidence, 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 I think is going to be really, really important going forward. And this is just an example of work from Wales and indeed uh, from Northern Ireland, where we've been looking at what might increase a return on investment in an education setting. And really volume, group work, responsiveness, starting early, and making sure that there's a mix of remote and in-person provision is really important. So I'm not going to go through all of this slide, but I'm going to plant the seed in your mind and I invite you to think about what are you doing in your country to try and gather more evidence, including a return on investment for career guidance. So can you say with confidence that for every pound or every euro that a government will put in to career support services, that there will be a positive return on investment? And this is one area I think that we could do more on. I talked about the importance of safety nets and Donst, you know, reminds us that um, we have to have safety nets in place. And again, the importance of career dialogue, of narrative, and the fact that some people need interpreters and a safety net is really important. And I think we can frame this to government policymakers around interpreters and safety net, um, particularly for politicians who might be skeptical that they had good career guidance. So therefore, everybody else uh, should be uh, the same. The reality when we talk about career guidance is that it's a puzzle for people outside of our profession. And we can think about how we can use the language to embed career development in the curriculum, to have enrichment activities for all, to focus on employability and skills development, and not to forget enterprise self-employment and entrepreneurship. And we have to meet these challenges together we have to look at ways in which we can increase student and teacher focus on career connected learning. Make Didre, it easy. Sorry, Didre, sorry. We have chat that we, we, some people don't see the presentation. Sorry, but I see the chat. Sorry. Me That's neither. Okay. I don't see the presentation either. But <laughs> sorry, but to interrupt. It's, but. It's okay. Don't worry. The most important thing is that people <laughs> can hear me. And you yes, definitely, but uh, we have, okay, that, that's okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Right. Perfect. okay. So thank, you. thank you. Okay, so I was just explaining the puzzle, uh, uh, use this image of a puzzle, and if you like, the four E's that can frame a national career support system, this democratic approach. If we don't have these embedding career in the curriculum, enrichment activities for all, employability and skills development, enterprise self-employment and entrepreneurship. It will just, we've got to find a way of framing that um, for policymakers and educators and employers to understand alongside the profession. We've got to meet the challenges together, as I was saying, around increasing student and teacher focus on career connected learning, make it easier for teachers and outside experts to connect and collaborate and show students how they can be fulfilled and make a livelihood. So we've got to find ways over the brick wall that we sometimes face or under the brick wall, or sometimes we really have to knock that brick wall down and actually be able to show evidence of initiatives and things that work. 
I'm currently working on behalf of the Ministry for the Economy in Northern Ireland, looking at 16 countries and examples of initiatives there on effective ways of providing a national career support system. We're sort of knocking the wall down maybe on some of the old practices, um, but also we're sort of looking at ways in which we can learn from others. And that report will be available at the end of January. It'll be published and I hope that you'll all find that quite useful. So I think one of the things that wherever we are in the world, um, we are seeing conflict, we are seeing divisions in society and career guidance, I do believe, is a way in which we can encourage a more inclusive society, a more tolerant society where we can actually help individuals, not just to help themselves, but also to help others. And you might like this idea, you may not, but this notion that we have citizenhood and parenthood, maybe we need leaderhood that conveys a, cons a real deep sense of relatedness and a future focused concern. This came from Dame Ruth Silver in the UK, who suggested that for career guidance, we need more leaderhood and we really need to be showing how career guidance is not just about supporting an individual, but supporting communities and societies. So I want to kind of come to, if you like, the penultimate part of my presentation, which is about technology and understanding the fundamentals of artificial intelligence and what that will do to perhaps a democratic approach to career guidance. In the chat, and again, please fully give me an idea of the answers, but I want to invite you to think about one. Will the use of artificial intelligence increase individuals' access to trustworthy careers, information, advice, and guidance? Or will it decrease, or don't you know at this moment in time? Increase, decrease, maybe you don't know at this time. Just in the chat, please, and no right, no wrong answers. Just it tell me what increase. you think. It will decrease, one answer again. Mm-hmm. People are thinking about that because of my yes. <laughs> increase. Yes, to 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 and maybe at this stage, you know, you might feel I don't know enough about yeah. artificial yeah, intelligence know. yet. Which is okay because a recent uh, survey of careers practitioners and policymakers indicate that for many people, this is a very new sort of um, uh, way of handling information. And, and a lot of people don't know about the various opportunities uh, that are there. But I'm going to invite you to think about the impact of chat GPT, um, virtual and augmented reality, gaming, gamification, chatbots um, in uh, the field of career guidance over the coming year and years to come. That what we know will be of benefit to the careers sector will be the new data-driven insights that artificial intelligence will bring. And actually hybrid services where we proved during COVID that we could adapt our services. So I'm going to quickly just show you this screen, but invite you to look at it later, which is the history of ChatGPT. And if you think back in the 80s, um, you know, there was a, a computer called Liza, which was looking at could chatbot technology um, create uh, mental health therapist uh, sessions for individuals. So this is something that um, the history We've had this explosion, particularly since uh, 
Hey, Joel, can you hear us? Hello? Ah, there you are, because we've lost you. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are, we are not having a good time, are we, with technology today, just as I was talking about the benefits of AI. So what I think okay. I maybe will, will do um, is I wanted to just share maybe two more slides and then I will pause, I think, and uh, make way for our next speaker. But I'm going to be here until the end. So if anyone has got any questions, then please do, do feel free um, to ask me. So let me just share, I've got a few slides, but I'm not going to show all of them. I'm just going to show maybe three more slides. So first of all, in AI, I want, can you see these slides okay? Yes, okay. Lovely. So I want to encourage you to think about, there's a technology trigger that has gone off now on artificial intelligence for education and for work. And remember career guidance at the intersection of both. But that we are moving up this peak of inflated expectations that there will be a lot of people that will think AI will be good for everyone. And actually we will reach a trough of disillusionment, a slope of enlightenment, and then it will plateau out. So if you're not using AI at the moment, then I would encourage you to read this article. There's a link um, in my slides. And the argument is about whether AI will transform or will it augment or will it supplant human advisors? And I'm going to make the argument that we will always need to have human advisors in the loop, but that we will have to be very careful about the ethics of that. What the future might hold in the extreme is that here in America, an eating disorder helpline fired at staff and transitioned to a chatbot. And look what happened. It had to be disabled because there was harmful responses in after firing humans. I've been looking at how we can use a chatbot, moving carefully with the career sector here in the UK to keep humans in the loop and to drive new data-driven insights. And again, happy to uh, discuss that. So here's my conclusion. I would encourage you to be vocal and encourage others to do so. Andrew uh, Bathingthwaite's advocacy model, really important. What are we doing for self-advocacy, empowering the clients with whom we work to make the choices and decisions that affect their lives? Professional advocacy, that practitioners serving as a bridge between their client and those in positions of power. Citizenship advocacy, expanding the roles and offering, if you like, um, career guidance as a resource to communities that might face marginalisation or discrimination. Or public advocacy, which is where we do actually have to draft public statements and inform uh, policy processes. So I'm going to um, sort of finish by just saying thank you. I'll stop sharing. I'm sorry that we've had a few little uh, technical blips, but I hope that what I have done is um, I've whetted your appetite to think about democratic approaches using technology, democratic approaches where we can do more in education, democratic approaches where we can think about decent work and how as careers professionals, we can help support individuals, not just into work, but whilst in work and their transitions at the latter stage of their life. Thank you very much, and I hope that you find that helpful. Thank you so much, Deidre, for your interesting presentation. Sorry for having to interrupt for, for due to technical things. It was very interesting because among others, we focused to the importance of communication, cooperation, coordination of stakeholders and uh, uh, guidance practitioners because we're we're an an old a network because if we don't cooperate if we don't coordinate democracy is losing its part to end users so thank you very much uh, of course as you see in the 
that uh, after the second presentation, we will have the discussion part. So please uh, be uh, free to uh, set your questions and our colleagues, Victoria from Euroguidance uh, Poland will coordinate the Q&A part. So let's, uh, it's time for Stephanie Tan. Uh, welcome, Stephanie. Actually, the webinar wouldn't be integrated if we haven't included presentation about projects and services, because one thing is theoretical aspect, but the other part is the, the, the projects and the services that were developed with and for end users. So please, Stephanie, we welcome Stephanie Tam from GTB, uh, from an organization from uh, Belgium. And Stephanie, you have the floor to to share your uh, knowledge and experience. Welcome. All right. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share our good practices or what we think are good practices. And hopefully it will uh, complement uh, the earlier presentation uh, within how we organized and implement our services uh, in career guidance uh, with and for uh, our users. So I will share my screen. Hopefully everything uh, will load smoothly. Let's see. OK, I will put it on full screen. Yes. All right. Can you see it? Yes, yes, perfect. OK, but you see also the little small screen maybe, no? Can you see? It's only the slides you see. I see the slide we see. OK, the GDP slide. OK, yes, all right. So um, I will um, first uh, situate our work within um, GTB. So GTB is an in-house partner for uh, the Flemish Service for Employment and Mediation and Vocational Training. So we are in-house uh, um, career guidance mediation uh, service um, within the uh, government Flemish Service for Employment and Mediation. So you see on the map, it's for the upper half of uh, Belgium. I will not try to explain short, in short why it's like that, because it's very uh, politically uh, complex. So here you see um, the uh, offices of VDAB and GTB. And actually, every GTB office is within the VDAB office. It starts within the inclusion uh, inclusive thought that every job seeker, every person, citizen that has the need for um, career guidance is in need for some support and guidance um, on his or her pathway to uh, employment, uh, can uh, drop in at what we call job houses, uh, job shops, um, and Literally, next to the offices of VDAB uh, career consultants, there are offices, there are desks of our colleagues from GTB. So you step in the same offices. It is not another offices, office where you have to ask your question if you have more specific needs. And so what does GTB do um, within the offices of VDAB? Actually, we do the same as um, VDAB, but we do this for job seekers or persons with uh, disability or people that are in vulnerable situations. Um, so we say that these, these are persons with disabilities or health problems uh, or uh, thresholds towards uh, the labor market. Um, within the social network or within their community. Um, so they have struggles to find or keep jobs. Um, and we also support our employers. So uh, we make the match between job seekers and employers. 
uh, we um, guide our employers in the recruitment of um, people with invulnerable situations that seek uh, sustainable jobs. Um, and so, let me see. So, our whole um, service and guidance uh, is based in our vision uh, mission statement. And so, we have uh, we are very customer and solution uh, focused. Um, it's not only just a methodology or a toolbox, it's written out in uh, our whole organization and in every aspect of our services towards uh, citizens with questions and needs of support in their pathway to employment. So we have uh, tailored pathways. Uh, we have uh, we are focused on paid employment. Uh, each job seeker or person with a certain need or a question uh, has a personal mediator. We approach the need for a career guidance uh, from an empowering perspective. Um, we have intensive and specialized mediation, so everything that we develop in our services are tailor-made, uh, are more intensive than uh, what the uh, VDAB offers. Um, and we have individual contacts and in-group activities. So it's a little bit of background information uh, about GTB and how we organize ourselves in our um, services for job seekers, uh, people who are in need of uh, career guidance. So here you can see our customer journey and the job seekers are placed in the middle. We, um, it, throughout all our contacts with our job seekers, we always start with the initial need or question of the job seeker. We don't start with what is wrong or what are the thresholds or what are your struggles. We always ask first, what is uh, the interest of the end user to come to our offices, to come to our desk and, and, and make contact with us? What brings you here? And then we start to explore, where are you headed? What are the dreams, what are the goals? Um, to what are, um, if you have a magic wand and you can change your situation, what would it be, what would it look like? Um, then we go on to determine what kind of support and guidance there is needed towards employment, towards uh, the dream career uh, that he or she wants. And we are especially looking to um, determine what's already working because we are working with people in vulnerable situations, people with disabilities, people with health issues, people with social struggles or emotional struggles, um, we find that it is important to empower our job seekers to uh, look for the exception. When, when situations were less harsh, when situations where they could find help, where they could um, initiate uh, some solutions to implement that more in their pathway to uh, jobs. Um, when we know what our goals are, when we know what our support system can be, we then look at, okay, what are the next steps? When we know all that, when we have all that information, uh, well, what can we do tomorrow? Or what when we when can we do from today on forward uh, to be to come closer to those goals and hopefully when we find a match uh, between the job seeker and uh, the employer we then transfer the information um, to uh, the uh, job uh, to uh, on-site learning um, towards the employer but at every step of the process in our customer journey, our job seeker and our employer are at the center of it. Um, it is important uh, to 
um, listen carefully uh, to what the job seeker has to tell us and follow that dream. Uh, and I think in that way, it uh, collides with what Deirdre um, explained to us, that the human interaction is very much needed. We also have a lot of tools and a lot of questionaries and methodologies, but the connection that we make with our job seeker at the center of it is very much as important towards um, reaching the goals. So, um, let's see. Okay, so our solution focused approach is very much based on um, solution focused coaching from Steve De Schaeser. Um, and I put here a quote um, because a lot of people, when we tell about our work and uh, career guidance for people with disabilities, they, they are much taken aback uh, about how we can create solutions for things that we cannot change sometimes. So uh, in essence, the solution focused approach says, well, when we stop talking about our problems and start talking about what is possible and solutions, then we can create solutions. It is not by questioning uh, every single aspect of problems and struggles and brick walls and struggles that we can create solutions. It's about um, uh, making depth in the, our, our contacts with our job seekers about possibilities, about skills, about solutions, uh, that, so that we can create pathways. I... Uh -huh. So in that, um, so I told you about GTB and I told you about our mission vision statements, how it's heavily focused uh, on the uh, solution focused approach towards our end users, our job seekers with disabilities. And so uh, within that framework, we have developed um, several uh, projects and several services that uh, to implement that vision and to uh, make um, and to develop with and for end users uh, tools that can be used in those pathway to employment. So the first one, so the link is in the in the PowerPoint. So we have made a web tool that is also available in English, Start to Can. Start to Can, as you can see, I've taken some screenshots. So in the middle, you have me. So it's very much this is has been developed within a scientific um, framework with a university and it's been developed with different countries. Um, and so we have also in the development of this project of this web tool, we have um, also uh, uh, asked the end user uh, to give us feedback on, uh, on the trials of this web tool. So we have, uh, it is very much with and for them uh, that we have developed Start to Can for youth, for young people uh, that are, are on the brink of entering the um, labor market. So it's for uh, young people that are still uh, in school and uh, have questions about uh, the transition to labor market, and so we can use Start to Can web tool where they put the picture of themselves in the middle, me, and where they can um, uh, input in on the web tool their different goals in their life. And since they are young, there may be different uh, life domains where they can um, put in some goals, some wishes, some actions about living. Maybe they want to move out, get their own place with a boyfriend, with a girlfriend or in a community. Uh, maybe they were, want to work on their health. Maybe they want to start working and then uh, also manage their finance. Or maybe they want to uh, uh, study further in higher education. So there, those are the different life domains where they can um, think about with the help of a coach um, about how they want to uh, make their life decisions and their actions toward their goals. So you can see here, for example, if you click on the live domain work, then you can see the different 
things that they can uh, reflect about. First, we start with I want. What are your dreams? What are your goals? What do you want? And then we go to explore what I can. So you see, it's very much for the end user. It's I want. What? It's not what do you want? It's I want and I can. And then as next step, I do. So we explore together with a, a career guidance coach uh, or mediation coach um, through uh, the different questions within the start to can web tool. So another project that we have is transit action. And I want to pause for a few seconds on the logo. The logo has been developed by our end users. So transit action is a projects um, that are for um, uh, end users, uh, young, uh, young adults, young people uh, with autism. And so they have designed our logo, Transit Action. As you can see, the end user is in the middle. Our end user within this project um, are not only young people with autism, but also the network around them. So um, within Transit Action, it was uh, within the deliverables, we wanted to um, uh, collect all skills, innovation tools to support young people with autism and their network, like parents, like services, professional service, and to help uh, professionalize and to help develop skills in uh, the support in the guidance of young people with autism uh, in the transition from school or inactivity towards employment. And as you can see, when we started this project, we made a research on good practices supporting the transition of young adults to employment. When we did the research, it was not an on-desk research within literature. It was a panel discussion. So we have asked end users and we have asked their parents and we have asked uh, the professional uh, network uh, of uh, our end users or uh, target group. What are the good practices that help you towards the transition from school or inactivity towards employment. So when we did the inventory of all those things, good practices and digital tools, it was not, we did not do a Google search. We asked them directly um, so that we could uh, develop more and collect everything on uh, the transit action websites. Those, this, uh, all the deliverables of this project you can find on the website of transitaction.eu. Uh, we have also within the project, we did in-person training and online tra training. Uh, we very much, we had the ambition to do more in-person training, but um, it was during COVID pandemic, so it was very difficult to uh, organize that. But we have online training and you can find everything at transitaction.eu where we have collected uh, and developed everything based on uh, democratic participation of our end users and our target group. Jump to Job is another project that has um, that is funded by Europe uh, and a transnational collaboration. So this project focuses on training peer mentors and job coaches for young people with disability. So uh, one of the um, difficulties we have is uh, sometimes we develop uh, tools or questionnaires or uh, interview techniques uh, but when we have people with cognitive disability, um, sometimes the questions are not adapted and sometimes we jump too, too fast to the conclusion. So, OK, we'll make a resume of OK, I will go with you to uh, um, to the employer and we will have an interview together. But we skip the part where um, we uh, give voice to the people we we skip the part where we ask them really what they want so in this project um, we have um, a training module for young people with disabilities in school 
in specialized education. And we go with one job coach and uh, a peer mentor. So that means that we have uh, a young person with a disability that comes with us within the class setting uh, and trains uh, the class of young people with disability to reflect about what they want in their life. So we plant seeds uh, and we empower them to uh, for them to be able to ask questions about their future, about what they want in their life. Um, so it's not about making resumes together or portfolio together or discover skills uh, um, to put on the resume. It's about uh, giving them space um, and time to reflect about who they are and what they want in their life within, of course, different um, techniques and exercises. Within HTB, we are starting uh, to work with experts by experience. So as I said, we have career guidance for people with disabilities. So we have in our organizations experts by experience. So people with disabilities uh, from personal experience. So they have global knowledge about disabilities, limitations, struggles, brick walls that they encounter, and they commit professionally within uh, GTV. So we, um, so they are kind of like translators of personal user experience, our end user, our job seeker, and the career guidance counselor. So sometimes they help translate uh, how uh, within, through the user perspective, how um, we can interpret the interaction within our systems and the end user um, perspective. We have, in COVID times, we have developed also uh, a podcast. So there are five interviews uh, that can be listened of our end users that tell about their experience of their pathway to uh, employment. It's no more than that. It's a very personal, personal relatable um, uh, experience that can be shared, that can be listened to. So we give voice to our end users and share the experience of how it is possible to find a job or not um, within our society. And so we have um, shared this very broadly. And so we took the opportunity of COVID uh, to make visible what we do with uh, our services. Another kind of uh, participation of our end users is giving strength to in-group activities and to peer-to-peer -peer counseling. So we have peer-to-peer -peer activities within these topics. Um, and so it's promoting self-growth and maturity, mutual empathy and understanding, and it's giving access to resources, advice and support from their peers. There's a difference between the contact, the individual contact of a career uh, guidance counselor and uh, the end user. Um, when you put people with similar questions, needs or experiences together, um, the information that can be gathered and the support that can be gathered within an in-group activity, it's much more valuable and much more impactful uh, for the end users than some professional career guidance counselor that um, uh, with the best intentions uh, wants to help or support uh, the end users. We have a very um, positive outcomes from those in-group activities. And to give voice uh, to all our um, end users, we have also, for example, a sign language interpreter. And so a sign language interpreter um, interprets very literally what is what is said during uh, contacts between a career guidance counselor and uh, our job seekers. But it's also cultural med mediation between one community towards another community, the hearing community and the non-hearing community. And it's also sharing uh, expertise in deaf and hard of hearing and work. So our sign language interpreters are like interpreters 
uh, boosted interpreters. So they uh, bring in expertise on the cultural and mediation and also about what are the um, inclusive uh, solutions that can be brought on uh, a workplace. Another example of um, user-centered um, services and actions, we participated in Duo Day, Job Shadow Day. It's a day where um, employee or future employee, job seekers and employers uh, are form a duo and where they can go uh, discover jobs uh, on the work floor, not in a simulator a simulated setting, not on a desk within the VDAB offices, but on on site. Um, so the employee and the employer get to know the skills and the commitment and the possibilities uh, in real life. So it's not talking about work, it is doing work and tasting work and trying out work um, that is very user centered. So that's it. Those were a few um, examples of some practices that we have within GTB, where we try to put our end users uh, on, uh, on the podium <laughs> of all our uh, services. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for sharing with us the customer's journey, as you mentioned before, through so many different and um, interesting projects that they are designed to face as much as possible their individual characteristic and needs. So mm -hmm. I think that we had with this uh, very interesting presentation, thank you once more for them, a, a, a holistic, let's say, approach for such a huge, of course, uh, subjects like uh, democratic participation. So, as announced in the beginning, uh, now we're going to stop the recording and we'll go to proceed to the discussion part that will be moderated by Victoria.